Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here, and joining the show for the very first time, though we've known each other for some time, Matt Stopsky, who is a producer on the Giants Radio Network, also Sirius XM NFL radio producer as well. And for this episode, I wanted to dive deep into week one because we're very close to it. We are marching right up to week one. It's right around the corner, Matt. And I want everybody to be ready for Vikings Giants in New Jersey. How are you? Uh, good, good. No, I'm, I'm actually planning already uh, for, for week one, you know, it, it, considering it is right around the corner. Uh, it's, you know, it's, we're already diving in, you know, we're already diving in. So I, I'm happy we're able to bring your listeners uh, some, some top level content today. <laughs> That's for sure. And uh, I saw today a report that Tommy DeVito had a very good practice for the New York Giants. And it's become a thing with the practicing and the OTAs and how guys look. I thought that we wanted to save that. Really what the actual NFL people talk about is when the pads come on in training camp. But that's way too far in the future. Anytime we can mm. decide today about something, then we will absolutely do it. But I do want to dive into this game because the schedule comes out. We get a excited about it. And the one game on the schedule where I went, ah, really was the opener against the giants because (laughs) I just don't feel like it has a lot of juice to start the season. And when you look at the next run of games for the Vikings, you've got all these big games coming and it could be a little bit easier to overlook the New York giants. So tell me where you think this team is at. They get Malik neighbors in the draft. We're still not sure about Daniel Jones's health. He said it's coming along, but it was a down year, a really miserable year for him last year after beating the Vikings in 2022 in the playoffs. Is this a team that thinks it's on the rise or thinks that it's drowning into the river? (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) No, they're definitely not drowning into the river. They're definitely on the rise. Uh, Listen, last year was a bad year. Uh, you know, everyone knows that. And I think anyone that was a smart football fan could tell you that it was going to be a rough year. You know, 2022 was kind of an odd season. A lot of the things bounced their way that probably, you know, if, if you flipped it a hundred times, it would probably come up you no know, half the time in, in favor of the Giants. It's happened to get very lucky. Uh, and this time in 2023, it, it was the other way, uh, like the Jets game that should have been a win. Uh, and they watch other games down the, uh, the Bills game that should have been a win. They would have pulled those games out in 2022, but they didn't. Um, so it was just a bad year. It was a, a rough schedule on the road, seven in the first nine, which is just, you know, that's hard to do. Uh, and then your best player gets hurt in Andrew Thomas. Uh, Sigon Barkley gets hurt. Uh, Daniel Jones has a, a hard regression back to the mean uh, in, in 2023. Um, and you have some coaching issues in terms of like, you know, staff camaraderie, which is why we saw the defensive coordinator leave. Um, so it was a rough year, right? And I would, I think to think that like that 2023 is really where the Giants are is not the right way to look at it, right? They're somewhere in between 23 and 22. I think they're a team that if everything clicks, they're a playoff team. Um, and if they put the Vikings in the first round, they'll get, they'll get a, uh, a playoff win 100% of the time, guaranteed. Um, But I think right now, Joe Shane has done a great job bringing in some good young talent, right? He was trying to get rid of all of the bad cap that Dave Gelman kind of put on that roster. And I think we're finally past that point, you know, Um, and I'm very excited to see what they're going to do with some of these young guys like uh, Tyler Newman uh, and Malik Neighbors, who I think can contribute almost immediately for this team. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, Vikings fans are aware of uh, Tyler Newbin and his potential as a playmaker. I want to get into this defense because when you pull up the roster of the defense, you're like, oh, actually, they have some guys. They've definitely got some guys. And uh, the Vikings offensive line is always a question. But the acquisition of Brian Burns here, and you talk about Newbin, uh, Kayvon Thibodeau has not yet... Uh, lived up to expectations, but Dexter Lawrence most certainly has. I mean, this looks like, and you know, the Deontay Banks pick, this looks like a defense that is fairly complete and has an argument to be pretty good. And I think last year, how was anybody supposed to tell? I mean, the offensive situation was so rough from the beginning, but then you're running through all sorts of different quarterbacks and everything else. They had their moments uh, as a defense last season, but then getting Brian Burns 
it makes it so I th- I'm imagining Vikings fans believe that going there and playing the Giants it should be a, a pretty easy win. You know, you type that in as a W when you get the schedule. But then when you look at the defensive roster, I think that your mind changes. How much different, though, do you think it's going to be now with a change at defensive coordinator and what they've added as far as pieces? I think you're going to see a significant change from last year. Uh, you know, Deontay Banks, the, the starting corner, there was a rookie last year, he gets another year of experience. Uh, bringing Brian Burns a pair along with Kayvon Thibodeau, I think he's going to be huge. Uh, Kayvon, you know, didn't have a great year in terms of like PFF grade and advanced analytics, but he did rack up sack numbers and pressure numbers, which when you're the number one defensive end or edge rusher, that could be a little rough. You kind of want to be good all around, but then that's Brian Burns. Let Brian Burns take, you know, the number one edge rusher stuff. And Kayvon can just clean up, right? And do what he does best. Also, teams can't play Kayvon the way they, they did a couple of years ago or last year, where they put almost everything to his side and were like, hey, you know, good luck. Because he was still a young player. Remember the, the San Francisco 49ers? They were putting uh, double tight ends to his side and making him like run the gauntlet to get to the quarterback. And, you know, he's still young. He's still reading at the same time. He's trying to figure out what's going on. He's trying to set the edge. This year, that's not the same. You can't do that anymore, right? Like now you have Brian Burns where you got Dexter Lawrence who might be the best at the tackle in football right now. Now that Aaron, Aaron Donald's gone. Uh, Bobby Okereke, who was in his second year with the New York Giants. Like it, there's a lot of things happening with the New York Giants. Um, you know, I'm really excited to see what, what what they do here. The real question is for for me is how the secondary comes, you know, comes to life here, right? Does Deontay Banks take that next step? You would think so that because he's a rookie last year, but you know, progression isn't, isn't a straight up path, right? There are some guys take dips into the first year. I think he'll, I, I expect him to go up a little bit. Corners are hard position to play. Uh, and it's hard to be thrown into the fire. Like, like, all right, go, go play, start week one and play against the best players in the NFL, especially because they had um, a Dory Jackson moving to the slot to start the year. And it was like, they were really putting banks down on there on an Island a bunch. And that's hard to do. Like the best corner, there are veterans in the NFL who can't do that. So, I think that I don't want to say there's nowhere to go but up because that's not true. You can go back to you can go down, but I think with the players on the roster, um, I think there'll be a, a significant um, move not towards me the top ten, but like that top half of the NFL. How good would you say Dexter Lawrence is? Because I would say in the two games that I watched him against the Vikings up close and personal. Very, very good. I look at him as uh, now maybe the premier player at that position in the entire NFL with Aaron Donald being out of the league. Uh, I couldn't name three guys who are more dominating in the middle and to now have these rushers on the edge or at least the the addition of Brian Burns. And then we assume Thibodeau is going to be a little bit better. I, that, that That is, if you're a Vikings fan, knowing that their left guard is going to very likely be playing for the first time as a real full-time starter, the center has been completely dominated by this player before. The right guard was famously dominated by this player uh, on a particular fourth and eight that resulted in Kirk Cousins checking down in a playoff game. But t- tell me more about watching Dexter Lawrence and his emergence of his to become a total superstar. Well, I remember when he came out of Clemson, I was still working for PFF at the time. So I had a chance to say that with Mike Renner. And when we were talking, I remember Mike being like, dude, guys this big should not move this quickly. I mean, he was right. And Mike is really good uh, at defensive line evaluations. He always has been. Uh, the only other player I think maybe in the league that's as good as him uh, it, in terms of the tackles is Chris Jones, another Mike Renner favorite. Um, Watching him go from uh, just a solid D tackle to start to now being, you know, one of the top two in the league is truly incredible. They they had to triple team him a lot of times last year, and that really still didn't work. You look by any metric, he's a top two defensive tackle, right? Whether it's base stats or, or advanced analytics or film study, he's incredible. Like he really is the anchor of the defensive line. Um, just. It, it, the way I look at it, imagine if Snacks Harrison could also rush a passer. That is Dexter Lawrence and also could run. Um, he's really, truly uh, kind of a unicorn, right? Because he's still playing like above the 320, 330 marker, and he's playing like Aaron Donald at 297. Like, that's, that's a nuts number. So uh, any team that has iffy interior offensive linemen, 
it's going to be a rough go because he can essentially you know stop the run by himself. Right. And this has been a problem because the Vikings stopped their own run uh, normally over the last uh, <laughs> couple of years, though. We do expect that it will be much better. But uh, in facing this team in week one with a new quarterback for the Vikings, whether it's Sam Darnold or J.J. McCarthy, something that we know they're going to need is a better running game. And I don't think that this is going to be a pushover team when it comes to either running or facing the pass rush that the Giants are going to roll out there. But the bigger picture on the Giants really surrounds around one man in the quarterback position and Daniel Jones. What are we supposed to make of Daniel Jones at this point? It's been an odd career arc. He comes into the league and everyone goes, man, looks just like Eli Manning. I remember he had that big game against, what was it, Tampa Bay? And everyone said, see, all you haters, you fools, Daniel Jones is the real deal. And then he settled into this sort of check down type of quarterback that averaged six and a half yards per pass attempt. He's never really had consistent elite wide receiver play. So there's this new dynamic of Malik neighbors being ridiculously talented and dropping into the mix. But after last year, the pressure just has to be through the roof on Daniel Jones because he wins a playoff game, then gets his face kicked in by the Philadelphia Eagles. So you come out, pay him $40 million a year uh, as a, uh, you know, a starting quarterback that looks like a franchise yeah. QB. And that just adds so much more to that. That, uh, situation, I think with him, because every single loss, it's like, well, there's a $40 million quarterback over there with Daniel Jones. But I think what we saw last year is he's not going to be a guy who takes a team that's struggling and says, get on my back and elevates them as you would expect from a $40 million quarterback, more of circumstance of how he's used, how good their offensive line can be. And maybe now we see him with a little more weapons than he's had before. Yeah, no, I think it's it's unfair, right? In terms of like, you know, just because they paid him $40 million doesn't mean he becomes Patrick Mahomes overnight, right? Like he is Daniel Jones. Like he is a, a solid plus starter quarterback, probably in that third tier of quarterback play where, you know, you're, you're not worried about him in terms of like your game planning when you're when you're preparing uh, as an offense, but you're also not going to rely on him to be the, the big difference maker. It has to be people around him that make the difference. Uh, and you kind of touched upon his rookie year. He was a gunslinger as a rookie, but he had all those turnovers, especially as a as, you know, on, on fumbles. And you kind of saw him like overcorrect the rest of his career. Where it's like, well, you know what? Now we're getting the ball out quickly. We're getting out quick. We got out short. And he hasn't really found like a good, happy medium yet. Um, how much of that is is coaching? How much of that is play calling? How much of that is Daniel Jones? I would say it's probably a mix of all three. Uh, but I think Daniel Jones is a quarterback you can play with, you can win with, you can win a division with. I don't know how far it goes in the playoffs, but we've seen, listen, Blake Bortles got to a championship game, all right? Like, I am not worried about the Giants like going deep into the playoffs with Daniel Jones. I just don't think he's going to Superman his way them to it. Like, he's not going to Eli Main 2011 a team. To this, because, like, that took only the complete naivety of Eli Manning because Eli just like was totally shut out from the rest of the world. He's like, he didn't listen to a single thing. And he's like, listen, I'm just going to throw it. We're just going to see what happens. Right? Like if Daniel Jones is a rookie was on this team, I would say maybe right. Cause that, cause DJ was let, just let it, let it fly as a rookie. He doesn't do that anymore. I hope he kind of gets back to that. hope that Brian Dibble can instill that confidence into him. Like, listen, chuck it, throw it. Cause there were times even during the season last year, um, and you would see Brian Dibble go up to Daniel Jones, like, dude, back of the end zone. Like you, you, he's open, throw the ball. And I think he's just like, it's like PTSD with him. It's like, I know, but like, I've had 17 coaches, Brian, I don't know what to do anymore. Uh, so I, I do think that, you know, when it comes to like, what do you make of Daniel Jones? I think that's what, that's the really hard question, right? I think you have to kind of understand that as a quarterback who's faced a ton of adversity, the Giants have not done any single favors with his career here. Um, and he's done an amazing job as a person handling it. Like he is about as good a person as you can find. Like he's a great dude. Um, I think right now, because I, I, I listen, is there a chance he turns it around and he Kirk Cousins himself into a pro bowler? Possibly. But most likely he's a plus starter and you can win the plus starter. You can win the NSEs with the plus starter. Um, I just, 
he, to think he's going to be Patrick Mahomes is would be foolish. I, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I would put it at quite a surprise if he made his way into the top 15 uh, in the NFL. You know, two years ago, we did see Brian Dable do some really interesting things with yeah. him. He ran him a lot, which caused the Vikings uh, quite a bit of problems in that playoff game. That I think it was a fourth down that he had a design run or a scramble for a first down. And the Vikings really just didn't have an answer for a guy that big who was moving as a pretty good quarterback on the run. And then they did a lot of stuff in the short passing game. It does stand out to me, though, that... I was going through this and I think that the most receiving yards he's ever had from a receiver is like 700, which Dar is and Darius Slayton usually, almost guaranteed Darius like, Slayton. <laughs> the Vikings wide receiver three usually gets about 700 yards <laughs> in the past. And that's, you know, just so problematic for him at this point though, have we gone past go with him where everyone's kind of decided all right, well, we kind of had our moment with him. And if he was going to carry it over to the following season, then maybe you could have made an argument. He could be a year in and year out winning quarterback, but we've, we've gone past that. He's had now multiple injuries that are pretty concerning. And you mentioned some guys, when they have this, when, when they fail and they hit the injuries and everybody puts the pressure on them, uh, it's not like everybody just says, all right, I'm here. I'm throwing the shackles off and I'm going to go crazy and have this great season, especially when you look at their offensive line. Is it wildly better? Probably not. I mean, uh, John, you know, I'd like to see John Michael Schmitz play uh, a little bit more of uh, another former gopher and see yeah. what that's like. But it, to me, it feels like we've already sort of decided where Daniel Jones stands to the point where I was actually a little surprised maybe, or some people were, I wasn't stunned that they stuck with him, but some people were surprised that they decided not to even draft a quarterback. Do you think that they should have done that, that they should have in this opportunity with this year's draft, picked a quarterback to compete with Daniel Jones? Honestly, I don't really think it matters, right? Cause it, they didn't have a shot at a quarterback. Like it, it seemed like the, Commanders and the Patriots were not moving off two and three. Like that was, wasn't happening. Right. Uh, and I'm very happy that JJ McCarthy was not taken at six. Like I was in the offices at Sumer sports with, with our buddy, Eric eager. Um, and I stood there watching the TV and, and watching the, the league ticker come across Malik neighbors. I went, all right, we can produce the rest of the show now. Cause like I was, if they drafted McCarthy, I was going to have a serious issue. Cause to me, McCarthy is, is, is Daniel Jones. Like that's the same level of play we're getting at him, um, at, at best, right? Like not best we're, for McCarthy. We're looking at like what, low Kirk cousins tier, but most likely he's going to end up in that Daniel Jones tier, which we already have Daniel Jones. He's already there. We don't need a second one. Um, so I think with the offensive line, yeah, it's a little better. And then, uh, John Michael Schmitz had a bad year, right? But sort of Frank rack now. So like, I'm not, I'm not writing him off yet. Let's see how year two goes. Center's a hard spot to play year one. Um, and and I'm not so I'm not surprised they didn't grab a quarterback. And we saw a quarterback really didn't get picked after the first round till what round four? Like, like it, was, it was a while before the next one got picked. And like, who who are you putting in there? Jordan Travis? The man has one leg. Like, I love Jordan Travis. I'll love him again in 2025. But like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna draft him to compete with Daniel Jones. Well, you already have a guy who's injured. So I think the Drew Locke thing with Daniel Jones makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, I, I, are we past that point? No, because he's going to start. If he is healthy for week one of the 2024 season, he's going to start. So I think, hey, let's, let's see what he can do. Let's see what he can do in 24, the better offensive line. Is it a good offensive line? Mm, mm. It's better. It's better. Listen, if Andrew Thomas comes back and plays like Andrew Thomas, then yes, it's much better. Um but it really depends on what they do with this offensive line shuffle, right? Also, we got to see who gets hurt like over the next three months before we we get into week one, right? Like we're talking about rosters that aren't even complete yet. <laughs> like there are guys that might be starting on these teams who aren't on the roster yet. Uh, so we got to see how this goes. Uh, so I, man, I would say, let's see what Daniel Jones can do with Malik neighbors, hopefully with Darren Waller. I don't know what his situation is. Is, is he still up in the air? I know. He, I remember texting it like a, a few of my friends, like have anything on Darren, nothing on Darren. So I hope he returns. Um, Cause then you have Darren Waller, Darius Slayton, Wanda Robinson, who's an incredible receiver. That kid, I think if he had consistent quarterback play last year, could have been a 
he would have been the, the top receiver for the for the Giants, but it just there, there were three quarterbacks playing. It was never going to happen. Um, so I I think I'm not I'm not off on Daniel Jones yet. I'm going to give him 2024, and if it doesn't work out in 24, then I expect him to move on 25. Okay, let me circle back to the McCarthy thing. So okay. you're sitting there on draft night, and you're saying, don't draft J.J. McCarthy, don't draft J.J. McCarthy. He's here with the Minnesota Vikings. And I'm curious why why you think that the ceiling is only something like Daniel Jones, because, I mean, just my impression of him so far is that he is very talented and also very, very young. I think it's probably higher than that, having seen him up close. The way that he played at Michigan, if you only went on that and you didn't contextualize it at all, and you only and you compared it to Bo Nix, you compared it to Michael Penix, you would have said, okay, well, this kid is just the game manager. And that was my concern coming out in the draft. Now having a chance to see him up close and the arm talent that he has, the size that I think he's added even since the end of last year, I think that there's a distinct possibility with the circumstances, with the best receiver in the NFL, with a former quarterback as his head coach and a scheme that has worked in numerous places that I would put it higher than the Daniel Jones tier of which I look at as sort of barely starting quarterbacks, like pro starters for sure. And as you said, you can win games under the exact right circumstances, but not somebody who's going to take you over the top. I look at it as because of his mobility and playmaking, it could be higher than that. So I would say a lot of things you just said, we could have said about Mac Jones as a rookie, right? And like almost verbatim. Um, And Mac Jones is now a backup in Jacksonville. Uh, And I think that him and Mac Jones share a lot of the same qualities in terms of like where I think their careers, I don't think he's going to have like that hard downturn that Mac Jones had, but like, you know, maybe sneaking in as a reservist for the pro bowl, like type type player. Um, the reason I think this about, uh, JJ McCarthy, uh, is I learned a long time ago that my eyes lie to me pretty damn often, right? Like I'm a Michigan fan. All right. In my heart of hearts, I want McCarthy to be the greatest quarterback of all time. But I know from looking at the numbers compared to his peers and not just the peers in this draft class, historical peers, he comes in right at that third tier. And especially in the tiers that matter in terms of like the, the, you know, the outside of pocket stuff, the ability to buy time, uh, his ability to make plays on the ground, with his feet are just not there. Right. We know he's accurate. Right. But even in terms of like interception percentage above average, like he's like, he's not, um, nothing he does is incredible. Right. And the things he does do that might be like, upper level like he's very good against pressure but like that what we've seen in terms of like how i've looked at how i've like you know mapped this all out it doesn't have a big play in terms of how you move up within those tiers to me like because eric eager said something in the 2023 draft uh styles make fights right there are uh statistics and categories and analytics that put you in tiers and then there are the subcategories that that how you pick the favorite within those tiers right he is a guy in tier three. And if you're like, you know what? I like a guy against, who's good against pressure. Maybe move him to the top of tier three. And if you're like, hey, that's why I want him over Daniel Jones. Fine, right? But if you're telling me, hey, it's him or Trevor Lawrence, that is not a conversation. Like it's Trevor Lawrence, right? Every single time. Um, and that that's why I have him in that. Because uh, as, as you and I were talking in Indianapolis, as you so lovingly call them draft weebs, which I think is the most accurate thing you, that anyone's ever called a draft analyst ever, uh, draft dweebs, draft analysts over trust their eyes. Uh, and I've learned over the decade or so I've been doing this, that once you've watched the 110th player, your eyes are just tired. So I have, I have learned to do more things analytically and build in what my eyes see. And from that McCarthy is, you know, a solid quarterback, a good quarterback, a quarterback that could be a top 15 quarterback, but not one that I ever see being like even Kirk Cousins. So that's interesting because uh, throughout the draft process, I felt pretty similarly to what you were saying about uh, the lack of a superpower uh, because he can make moves on the run and he's very good at throwing while he's uh, on the move. If he's rolling out or if he's escaping, 
Uh, but it's not like Jaden Daniels where he's going to run for 10 yards a carry in college and just blow away the Florida Gators and leave them completely in the dust. It's not like the Drake may where he can be off platform, flick the wrist and the ball goes 40 yards into somebody's hands down the middle of the field or something like that. Uh, I have been impressed more than I thought I might be about the velocity of the football. And I know there's that combine MPH Mm -hmm. and that that could be kind of messy because Baker Mayfield by that metric has one of the strongest arms in the league and he does, but that doesn't make you one of the best throwers all the time. Uh, And there's a lot to be done here. I think the thing with McCarthy is that I would give him as far as his grade with all of those statistics and everything else, just an incomplete. We had such bigger samples with everybody else. And with McCarthy, you kind of have to wait for the picture to come into clarity at the NFL level. And he actually reminds me of an NBA player that's drafted when they're 19 years old. And it's based on one year in college and they did something and you've got a set of skills where you're going, I'm believing in those skills more than anything else, because I can't see the extra three years. It isn't Iverson. It isn't Duncan. It's not Patrick Ewing from back in the day or Michael Jordan, where you can see them develop in college. I have to guess how they'll develop in the pros with Penix, with Knicks, And with Jaden Daniels, like those guys already had huge samples of playing. And so I guess I'm not trusting myself either as far as knowing what the rest of the story is going to be, because I'm going to watch it play out here in front of me rather than seeing most of the story in college. And then if you could be the same player in the NFL, then you're very good. Does that make sense? No, I agree. And, and, and the way I I would say there's two things onto that. The first one is we're making a lot of assumptions here that we know what uh, coach Harbaugh was thinking in Michigan, right? They're like, Oh, you know what? We're this run first team as if we just forgot about what his teams were like with the Niners, like Colin Kaepernick didn't just run that offense for a year. And then Alex, like, Alex Smith on those Niners teams, while he was not the most important offensive weapon on that team, he did a lot on those teams, right? I, th- I think if he if Coach Harbaugh had a better quarterback, he would have used him differently. It's, it's the way I would have looked at it, right? Now, he didn't have to, right? Alabama had to add a down year. Ohio State's not been the same in the last couple of years. They were able to run through that, and 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 Washington was a joke. So they were able to to, to survive pretty handedly and 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 be okay and win national championship. Um, uh, so that's what I would say first. The second thing is I'd always be very cautious about putting on like, you know, rose colored glasses when it comes to like a play your team drafts. Right. I had a buddy of mine who works, who works in the league. Um, and we, we were speaking about a quarterback that his team was probably going to draft. And he's like, you know, I really don't like him. I don't think this is a good move. I don't think it's a good move. And then it got confirmed like, all right, this is going to be our move. And the next day, he's like, you know, I kind of like some of them. I'm like, dude, relax. And you know what? His first opinion was right. The guy ended up sucking. Uh, so it's like, you know what? It's just take a step back. Um, you know, the velocity issues. Yeah. Like we, I would like to know like what his velocity looks like in terms of throwing to the outside sideline. Like, like that's, that's the biggest thing, right? Cause every time the Michigan threw a deep out, I like held my breath with McCarthy down the field, straight on the field, middle of the field. No problem. Like that's, you can launch that thing. But it's it's a different velocity going 20 yards to the left versus 60 yards straight down the field. Like it's a different velocity. Um, so I would say like that's where I'm cautious. Um, but also, you know, you guys had a, a rough season last year. Like, are you comparing McCarthy to like what you guys just saw? Or is or is you guys are you comparing him to like the other quarterbacks, right? And also you guys played in a, in, a, in a division where like QB play is kind of funny, uh, you know, outside of Aaron Rodgers. Um, but yeah, like, it's just, it, I, I would say it's may. Right. And I, I'm not going to kill McCarthy. I'm also not going to say that I could be wrong. Right. I change these grades yearly because better you know, players go up and down. Right. Like Lamar Jackson, but prior to this MVP year had two years of just like being irrelevant. Right. Like he had like a, he had a Pro Bowl year, but so does backup. So, like, come on, like, let's 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 dial that back for a second. Um, so, like, listen, maybe 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 the numbers are wrong, and you're right, and McCarthy ends up being that guy. But I would say, if I'm a betting man, nothing historically tells me that he's going to be the guy. 
Yeah. And uh, so when I was looking through for comparisons historically, as we always do during the draft season, it was very hard to find quarterbacks that were picked at his age that didn't mm-hmm. have huge statistics and also weren't six foot five, because a lot of times it has to check one of those boxes, right? If they're going to be that young. And there were some comparisons like Mark Sanchez, for example, a guy who people bought into his personality, his being a winner and all that, but he didn't put up huge numbers at a program that won a lot of games and and so forth. And, uh, but that's going back a million years. So it's really hard to find recent examples. Don't don't, don't say a million uh, years for Mark Sanchez, man. Well, uh, (laughs) we are, we are, we are. Mark Sanchez is like a old broadcaster now uh, (laughs) and has been out of the league for a while. We are that old, but it is true that it goes back a really long ways now to find similar quarterbacks to McCarthy. The thing that is for me, what I like to do, you talk about the approach of, Mm -hmm. you know, after they pick the guy or whatever. uh, One thing I know is that I never know when it comes to quarterbacks that my opinions in the past of them in the draft have not really mattered at all. I've had some right that I feel great about and some wrong that I just don't tell anyone about. Um, but, uh, oh, no, wait, that would make me a draft analyst. I'm actually fine with telling uh, yeah, you yeah. which ones uh, I have you, wrong. You're not a dweeb? Uh, no, you just... Not, uh, you, not a dweeb. <laughs> I, don't, I don't go back and erase the old tweets or whatever that had my bad takes of Malik Willis number two overall or something like that. Uh, I didn't have that opinion. I just mean draft analyst. Anyway, the point just being that uh, what I like to do, my approach is... Because I am so bad and the nation is so bad and the league is so bad at figuring out even the order of these guys and whether they'll succeed is I take everything that I thought before they drafted a guy, no matter what position this is, it could be Lewis Seen, it could be Delvin Cook when they picked him, whatever, and I toss it in the garbage because I'm going to get to see them play in practices against the NFL team. And that's where I'm more comfortable watching games on YouTube of JJ McCarthy or watching them in my living room versus training camp. And now we're OTAs mini camp. And that means a lot less, but training camp preseason real games that I can be there for and watch this guy, or I can be in the locker room and I can hear what the coaches are saying. It's so much better for a sample size to me that I just say, you know what? Like, I know I had some of the same criticisms and questions as you have, and the Vikings had some of those too, because Kwesi Adolf Lomenza came on the show and talked about them, like that the sample size was, hey, how do we figure this out when a guy hasn't thrown that many passes? But my first impression of him is that the talent is there to become the raw talent, how big he looks, how fast he runs, how hard he throws. That's really all I got right now is there to potentially be more And I know he's going to have the circumstances to potentially be more. And that's really the best I could do. And I could say potentially, but whether that comes to fruition, a hundred things have to happen before he gets there. Right. And and listen, I I think that's a fair, that's a a fair way of doing it. Right. And I think that's absolutely fair. Um, As someone who is more of a draft weeb, I I like to put my name on it a little bit earlier and then be like, Hey, listen, I won't know until August. Right. I have to know by April. And if that's, the case like all right this is this is where it's gonna be now so i do adjust my grades the week after because where a player goes does matter right it matters a lot um so i i, I do I like how you're looking at that i i don't want to say he doesn't have a ton of snaps it's not like this is a guy it's not like we're talking about mims from georgia who had like 400 total snaps right like what about like a guy that, that played a full year led a team to the national championship when i did crunch the numbers now granted i am not a data scientist i am not Hey, Seth, yet the numbers looked very similar to CJ Beathard. I'm just going to put that out there. You, you could draw it back if you want. I'm just saying when I, when I ran the numbers, I was like, E, mm, okay. Like a rich man, CJ Beathard, which listen, I don't know. How, do you like CJ Beathard? How, how do you feel? <laughs> how do you feel about CJ Beathard? Yeah, big fan. He mm, was great man. when he came in for the Jaguars last year for a couple snaps. Yeah, exactly. He's great. No, Niners great. Uh, Niners legend, really. So I, I think, you know, in the end, though, and this is what I love about the NFL, right? Uh, when we when we actually get to the to the league, the and when I when I grade pro players versus how I grade college players, totally different, right? Like grading college players, I'm looking at what translates in the league. What I think about a player matters so little. It's a production based league. If you're not producing, who cares, right? You can throw the ball a hundred yards, but if you're a back, if you're the third stringer on a team, you're probably not good. 
right? The league is telling me you're not good. Uh, so we're he's we're gonna see what he can be. You know, like I said, right around the corner because week one is coming up in like a day. Vikings Giants, we find out right, whether right. McCarthy is good. And then after that game, we decide, uh, which I'm sure the National Football League will. It is a fascinating subject with him, though, to go back and forth between the small sample and what we know. And there's one particular quarterback that I was very wrong about that lives in the back of my mind when I think about McCarthy. And when I think about the data and the statistics and how hard it is to use college statistics and apply them to the NFL. NFL statistics tell a pretty good story. If you've got mm -hmm. the right ones that you're looking at and fantasy people are amazing at this, at being able to look at all the data and factor it and say, this is what this guy is going to do over the next three years. And a, a lot of times they're fairly close. If the player has a big sample size and stays healthy, but with college, and I'm not saying that he's Josh Allen because he's not six foot six, 240 pounds and he does throw the ball hard, but he doesn't throw it like Josh Allen hard who no. can throw the ball 80 yards in the air. That's not McCarthy. He still uh, needs to develop the deep shot uh, ball, but that the tools and the person mean more to me now than the statistics, which is weird for me because my book is called football's a numbers game. Yeah, and seriously. because you know how much I have appreciation for the numbers, but that's why when I look at him, McCarthy, in these practices and I go, I see what I'm supposed to see and I see also how much it's going to have to develop. And I think I want to not worry too much about, like you're talking about, those statistical comparisons are not wowing in college. But here was Josh Allen, who had terrible statistics in college, or Jordan Love, who had bad statistics his final year and threw a bunch of interceptions and then gets his time to develop. And both of these guys, like McCarthy, need time. So I actually think, Matt, that we're probably going to be talking about Sam Darnold as the week one starter in this game that is right around the corner, Vikings and Giants week one. Uh, so I, I think you're probably right. I think they're going to give it to Sam first. Although I do think that as of this moment, McCarthy's probably better than Sam Darnold. Like when, we were, when you were talking about, about uh, Daniel Jones, like you could have said Sam Darnold at the end of that conversation. And it'd been the same thing, right? <laughs> Um, but, and when you were talking about Josh Allen, I went back and looked at it, you know, while you were talking, sorry, I was, I promised I was listening to you. Um, I was looking up the numbers that Josh Allen had, uh, in terms of like those, like, uh, the key statistics, right? So big time throws after two and a half seconds, right? Does it matter? Well, when Josh Allen is one and Patrick Mahomes is two, I would say it kind of matters, right? Like I would say yes, from a from a traditional stats perspective, Josh Allen was not good. But that's why you can't just look at you no know, accuracy number, turn of play percentage, big time throw percentage, which by the way, none of that stuff matters, really, in terms of like, you know, college or pro. But you gotta find the ones that and that's why I think it's a it's a really big deal here is um and I think also part of the problem with the analytics community is uh they're always looking for numbers that are stable, and sometimes numbers that are stable don't really matter from college to pro. You got to find the numbers that the guys that we know to be great produced at in college and find guys who also kind of fit around that area. Uh, so I think there were numbers that Josh Allen did that showed like, oh, wow, this guy's great. And McCarthy does not perform highly in those areas. And that's what concerns if he was if he did well in those areas. But, like, you know, you're right. That's Josh Allen. But we're not seeing that. And it's like, oh, you know, maybe he's. A rich, a rich man, CJ Beathard. So, um, but like I said, going back to Sam Darnold, uh, I do think Sam's going to be, is going to get uh, a longer leash, right. To, to, to beat out McCarthy. I don't think they want to throw out a rookie quarterback week one to Brian Burns, Dexter Lawrence and, and, and Thibodeau. That's mean. Uh, but if you're telling me like in a vacuum, who's better today, uh, McCarthy, like, I think even like, for, and this is, this is another thing, right? I actually have a separate formula for our, what their rookie year grade is versus their their grade overall because we've seen guys start hot and then Mac Jones just does suck right like his grade right now is higher in my book than Sam Darnold it's by two points it's not a massive difference right this is a Styles make fights type thing they're in the same tier uh but like if you're there's not a big difference between Sam Darnold and 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 uh and um JJ McCarthy at the moment so I do think because of that, they will they'll might lean towards the veteran and let him take the thousand sacks in week one and then let McCarthy start. 
Yeah, I mean, I think with uh, Darnold, what it really comes down to is just how experienced he is. And when we watch practice, you see somebody in McCarthy who is certainly gifted, but it needs a lot of work. Just even throwing to the right place, throwing on time, understanding the concepts. That's what's supposed to happen in the coming months where you could see us getting into training camp a couple weeks into camp. And then it's a legitimate battle between who's actually performing better right now. It's just, can Sam Darnold get him lined up and run a play? Yes, he can. Can McCarthy not yet. And that just speaks to how early uh, we're, we're sitting right here. Let me ask you one more thing. Um, as can can your, you hear my daughter crying? Yeah, I was going to say, as your child we, protests, because we're, we're, we're mentioning podcast, Sam yes. Darnold in New York, and that yeah. lead, that's you oh. hear what you're doing. You're okay. You're making yeah. my 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 infant daughter uh, cry her eyes out because Sam Darnold brings back PTSD to even Giant fans because we had to sit there and watch that <laughs> horrendousness that is Sam Darnold. Well, I deeply apologize uh, for upsetting yeah. your child. Traumatize my um, child. Yeah, it's that's not my fault. I didn't throw all those intercepts. I didn't hire Adam Gase. Uh, someone else did. Uh, but can, I, I am, can you find I, who did? I think that's, uh, that's a, that's a big question. They, I mean, look, uh, I know they got rid of the mafia largely in New York, uh, but there should have been crime sweeps of, uh, against football, uh, that should have taken more people out than it did maybe from the New York area. <laughs> but, uh, when it comes to, uh, Saquon Barkley leaving, I was curious about that. He's one of those guys that when you watch him at the stadium, you understand much better the Saquon Barkley experience because he just could find his way to yards no matter what. It would look like he was stopped in the backfield and he's dodging people. He's shedding tackles. He could do just about anything. He destroyed the Vikings. And uh, now we're talking, and look, I know people think running backs don't matter. They do. Uh, Devin Singletary, kind of a drop off there. Like, how do they replace what Saquon Barkley gave them? Uh, Numbers wise, I think they'll be all right. It's it's the locker room that's really the bigger difference for me. Um, and it's the thing about Saquon, uh, and I didn't fully appreciate this either until I worked for the Giants. It's just like how great of a person he is. Like he's a great teammate. And he's a great dude. He he prepares very well, and he gives it his best. Right? Like he and he is a leader. Um, that's where I think he'd be missed more than like just like you know how you going to place it on now a thousand yards on the ground. Like we, we've seen pretty okay running backs be thousand yard rushers, right? That's not where I think the giants are going to miss him. I think it's going to be in clutch moments. Uh, hey, you know, we got get, we need a big play from somebody. Who's it going to be? It would be Saquon Barkley. You know, if we need someone to, to rah, rah around, who's it going to be? It's be Saquon Barkley, right? Saquon Barkley statistically, you know, and, and analytically as well, like wasn't that, special right and that's what you hear a lot of the analytics guys were like oh like it's fine but to like people in the locker room losing saquon hurts like that it does hurt i understand why it had to happen that way because you know you can't you can't sign someone to 12 million dollars based on feelings right like you need some numbers to back this up um and there just wasn't enough to do that um it, it sucks way worse than he went to philly don't don't get me wrong like if he went to houston it would be a totally different story but like oh well you know good luck to him in houston i hope nothing good happens uh, for Saquon Barkley in Philadelphia. Um, but it's just like, that's, that's really the biggest drop off for, for me is not, is again, it's not going to be the thousand yards. Like can devil sing and Terry go out and get a thousand yards? Absolutely. Like, and you know, and like, like, what's not, and this was the same thing when he came out at the draft, let's not like pretend that Saquon Barkley didn't get 35 yards against Rutgers. All right. Like, like there, it's not like he had every game. He was, he was blowing out you no know, opponents. He had some stinkers like, you know, that was always because he was a lot of homeowner or bus type guy, especially early on in his career. Um, the, the big difference for me is going to be like, hey, who who's our matchup guy, especially in the passing game? Uh, who's our big play guy and who's our, our locker room leader on the offense? Because uh, it's not Saquon Barkley anymore. This uh, game here between the Vikings and Giants that's coming up soon uh, is going Around to, the I, I think, really be dominated more by talk about who's a quarterback for the Vikings than the terror for the opponent, but uh, could be one of those quietly interesting games like Vikings and Bucks that ended up impacting the Vikings oh, season yeah. last year, even though we weren't super hyped about it. So uh, Matt, I appreciate your time. You are a great friend and uh, enjoy talking ball with you. I'm sure that Vikings fans who only want to hear positive things about JJ McCarthy will not want you back on the show, but I do. Uh, because you're good at this and I enjoy our football conversation. So I appreciate you taking the time to come on and uh, we will do it again soon, my friend. 
Absolutely. I have to console my my daughter because now she there's way too much Sam Darnold talk for a New York uh, area talk show. Can't can't do it. Are you going to be in in New Jersey for this for this game? I think so. I haven't decided yet. It's not one of the easiest places to fly into travel to not one of the cheaper places to go to. So, I mean, if you're letting me stay at your house. Uh, I asked my daughter now. My daughter oh, is traumatized. Okay. Like, yeah, I, all right. I, yeah, Fair it's, enough. It's, it's, my daughter is so okay with Manning. it. Eli oh, Manning. Eli Manning. No, no, you're t- t- too late. It's oh. too late, Matt. You ruined it with Sam Darrell talk. If you bring up Zach Wilson next, David Tyree. There we go. I love David. Tyree. Oh, he's, he's she calmed best. right down. Yeah, she, she did. She now she's now she's you now sucking her thumb. Just great. Just thinking about helmet <laughs> catches. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Matt. Take care, buddy. Later, buddy. Thank you so much.